Hello, it's Bruce Williams again. Today I would like to deliver the first part of a multi-lecture series on the pathology of domestic ferrets. As I do with all of my lectures, I want to start out each one by thanking colleagues and friends who have given me images for these lectures, either directly or through online collections. Well, here's the subject of our talk today. We're going to start with some basic information about the ferret, and then we're going to talk about diseases of the nervous system. This is the domestic ferret, a widely used laboratory animal, as well as a pet species all over the world, which has gained in popularity due to the fact that it does well indoors, especially as an apartment dweller, and is fairly hypoallergenic when you compare them to cats and dogs. The Latin name for the domestic ferret is Mustella putorius furro, which roughly translates from the Latin to the little thief who catches mice and stinks. I think that's somewhat of an unfair appellation for this animal as someone that who kept ferrets for many years and my father before me had ferrets. They do very well with a weekly or bi-weekly bath and once you neuter them they have very little odor at all. However, like most of their mustelid cousins, the intact animals generally have a pretty good odor which other ferrets tend to find very attractive. And they also, not as much as skunks, but they do have anal sacs, which when expressed, if they're frightened or stressed or traumatized, may result in a very malodorous, fishy smell. If left to their own devices, they would catch mice and other rodents. They are obligate carnivores, like most of their mustelid cousins, but because we've made them indoor animals and switched their diet considerably, we're going to talk about the problems we have bred into these animals, and we continue to further with abnormal nutrition when we get to the section on gastrointestinal and endocrine diseases. Because of the way we have bred them for the pet trade and the way people like their ferrets, we have bred into a great gender dysmorphism into these animals with large males around two and a half pounds or more and small females at about half of that size which obviously could cause problems with dystocias later on down the line. Colorings are very important in the ferret world from a number of perspectives both for popularity among the ferret owning public and from a pathology point of view. We're going to talk a lot about that in this particular lecture. This is the very typical Fitch coloration. The little mask across the eyes, the dark parts on the body, especially in the extremities. And in older literature, you may hear this referred to as Fitch coloration or even Fitch ferrets. Some people even called them Fitches for a while. The other very common coloration, the other base coloration, is a lack of coloration. Albino ferrets, and you can notice that this animal has the red eyes and a total lack of dark coloration, are the base for the creation of a number of what I would call party-colored ferrets. When they're bred together, you can get all sorts of interesting colorations and this is the uh, the color and coat pattern chart from Marshall Farms a large producer in the US and you can get any of these colorations that you want and essentially they are made by breeding albinos and fitches together and back breeding them to get some of these very interesting color patterns including the blazes and the pandas all with these splashes of white now, what I want to mention is that albinism is a birth defect. Whereas we prize white German shepherds here in the U.S., in Germany they're often killed at birth because when you have one birth defect, 
You often have a constellation of them. And much of the problem with albinism is the result of defective migration of pigmented cells from neural crest to where they're supposed to be in the body during development. Many def different defects in a variety of species are the result of partial albinism or albinism, including a ganglionosis of the GI tract in white foals. We're going to talk about this as we begin to cover some of the problems in the nervous system. Okay, here are a couple of white ferrets from New Zealand, and this picture was taken by Dr. John Gorham many years ago, but I still use it because these are such great pictures of an outbreak of canine distemper in a facility in New Zealand. The fact that these animals are white are of no moment here, could be any animals, and ferrets and other mustelids are exquisitely susceptible to the same virus that causes distemper in dogs. And if you know anything about the disease or the presentation of distemper in dogs, you know pretty much all you need to know about distemper in ferrets, except for the fact it tends to be accelerated with canine distemper causing a fatal infection in as little as 12 days in ferret adapted strains and up to 45 days in animals who are exposed to the street virus. One of the problems that we see, and I continually see canine distemper outbreaks every year, is the fact that many of the major producers will move the ferrets as quickly as possible up to the age of five weeks of age where their vaccination status is very poor They've often had one vaccination against distemper, and then they go into an area where they may be commingled with puppies of a similar poor vaccination status, which just sets everybody up for uh, heartbreak. Another problem is that many of the ferret-owning public or those that own rescue operations with upwards of 100 animals often do their own vaccinations, and they may cut the amount of vaccine and give one vial to three or four different animals, not really achieving a significant titer in any of them. And when canine distemper comes into a facility like that, it can be a real problem. Okay, so we're looking at uh, two animals. The animal on the left is obviously cachectic, moribund, probably suffering from severe dehydration and scours, which is very characteristic of the terminal stages of distemper in ferrets. The ferret on the right here is exhibiting classic signs of canine distemper with a ocular mucopurulent discharge and photophobia. Obviously, these ferrets are not too well domesticated as they're being handled at least with one glove. But you can see that this animal has matted feces around the hind end because it has diarrhea. One of the very characteristic findings in any animal with canine distemper is immunosuppression. So these animals often do not die of the direct effect of the virus itself but as a result of concomitant immunosuppression and infectious disease affecting the respiratory and gastrointestinal tracts. Something else that you can see in this particular animal is that the nasal planum is crusted and hyperkeratotic. If we could see the foot pads, we'd probably see that there's excessive keratin on them as well. Ferrets exhibit hard pad disease extremely profoundly when compared to dogs. Let's go back to that ferret we looked at before. Obviously, this ferret is not feeling very well. We have a mucopurulent ocular and nasal discharge. He's been rubbing it on his fur, among others. Here's one that's not quite as bad yet. Same type of thing with the ocular and nasal discharge. And you can start to see the buildup of keratin scale on the uh, on the nasal planum. Uh, interesting in ferrets with pink coloration, 
uh, you can pick that up very, very quickly because these uh, areas of pink start to turn orange. It's sort of characteristic. Here's another Fitch ferret with distemper. You can see a very early uh, stage. Those pads are starting to turn somewhat orange. Uh, I do get emails about uh, animals with hyperkeratosis. This can be seen in older animals just as an aging change and, and uh, a lack of efficiency of shedding cornified epithelium. But in a young animal or in multiple animals, when I hear about uh, hyperkeratosis, um, I usually give the bad news early. I do recommend in these cases, because we're often dealing with a large number of animals, that those animals be segregated and euthanized only on the basis of hyperkeratosis of the foot pads and nasal plana. It's a hard thing to do, but uh, I've learned over 25 years of working with ferrets, if you don't do that, you're looking at a lot more deaths in a facility outbreak. This isn't actually a ferret. This is a mink. Same exact story. We have some scouring here, but you can see uh, the sort of terminal end of the hyperkeratosis, how much, uh, how much scale you get. Hard pad disease in mustelids is almost exclusively the province of, uh, of canine distemper. Histologically, as we said before, most of these animals will ultimately succumb to diseases associated with immunosuppression, especially bronchobacterial bronchopneumonias. And in the upper left, you can see the, uh, the normal appearance of the ferret lungs with wide open and clear airways and alveolar spaces. And at the bottom right, you can see here that in a ferret with canine distemper at about 35 to 40 days that there is almost no open air spaces at all with all the alveoli full of uh, neutrophils, fibrinedema, cellular debris, and the airways now are filled with reflux from those alveoli. I have never found canine distemper a particularly difficult disease to make. Even on routine H&E, there's always a high index of suspicion. And the thing about uh, ferrets and their susceptibility to canine morbillivirus viruses, they develop tremendous numbers of viral inclusions uh, extremely quickly in almost any type of epithelial cell and a lot of mesenchymal cells as well, including inflammatory cells. The urinary bladder is a classic place to look, and you can see that almost every transitional epithelial cell here has a large, very prominent 2 to 4 micron intracytoplasmic protein inclusion. A couple of them, if you look very closely, you may see some intranuclear inclusions, which are the virus particles themselves, but the, you can't miss these viral inclusions. Other places that I routinely will find them uh, would be the biliary epithelium, always a very profitable place to look. The gastric mucosa is not too bad, but, but because of the colors of the various cells, it can be a little more tricky. But you can look just about anywhere. We're looking at one of the paw pads here. We have an extensive layer of scale here. Uh, we have these exrine sweat glands, which let you know that we're looking at the paw pad. And if you look closely, uh, you will even see inclusions in the cytoplasm of the epithelium of the pads. Almost any skin biopsy from an affected animal will have viral inclusion. So not a difficult h and &E diagnosis to make. If you want to be absolutely sure, you can see the extent of the viral antigen in these great immunos from Dr. Matty Cupel, who's done great work with uh, ferrets over the years. And this is more viral antigen in the airway epithelium, as well as in macrophages within those occluded alveoli. So, not a difficult uh, diagnosis to make. 
I generally recommend euthanasia when I get that phone call of any affected animals in hopes of saving lives down the road. Occasionally you'll read articles on the internet which are very unfortunate that people say that they have found a way to cure uh, distemper. I consider distemper one of the most important diseases of the species. There is no cure. Infected animals will invariably die and if we wait too long they'll take a lot of others with them. Another less important disease of ferrets is rabies. And this is false advertising. This is not a ferret with rabies. I've never actually seen a ferret with rabies. And because they're exclusively indoors and they are, uh, a, we have the ability to vaccinate for rabies in these animals, it's a very uncommon finding, at least in the uh, United States and other countries in which they are primarily indoor pets. This is actually just a ferret that uh, wants to get out of his cage. They tend to investigate a lot of things with their mouth, and this one just wanted out. So, But I use this as my introduction to rabies. Uh, ferrets and other mustelids can exhibit both the furious and dumb form of rabies. The closest that I ever got to a rabid ferret was a facility in Northern Virginia, about 10 miles from where I live. And it was a rescue, and they had about 125 ferrets, but they also had a couple of mink. And they kept the mink outdoors, and they kept all the ferrets indoors, and they had a couple of mink in a cage on the back porch. And one day I got a call that one of the mink was found dead, and could I autopsy it, which I did. And everything looked fairly normal, and I was at a loss for a diagnosis. And then when the slides came back, I noticed within the neurons there are these large, these are, these are just lipofusin granules, but these sort of pink, not the most prominent, round uh, inclusions are negri bodies and very characteristic for rabies. And we didn't have any, uh, any clue that we were going to be dealing with rabies, but going back and looking at uh, at the facility and the way the animals were kept, it turned out that uh, that raccoons were coming in at night and reaching into the cage to get at the food that was put in the mink cage, and they had transmitted rabies in this fashion. And this case was actually typed out as a raccoon variant of rabies, which is the most common in the uh, mid-Atlantic courier, raccoons being the uh, major uh, reservoir for this disease. As I said before, for many years we have been able to vaccinate. It is an annual vaccination for rabies, certainly well worth the investment. And here's an old box with all the species, and I was very proud to see that ferrets were featured prominently on this vaccine. I highly recommend an annual rabies vaccination, a distemper vaccination, and heartworm prevention for these animals kept indoors, even in the U.S. Okay, there's a very interesting uh, case here that was published. We published this a number of years ago. We see it uh, repeated uh, over and over again, and it goes back to the problems that are associated with albino ferrets and breeding albinos into the line to try and get these party colored mixes. Uh, this is a single litter. These are four animals from a single litter, all came out uh, basically at the same time. Uh, none of them were born alive. And you can see a variety of defects, most obviously most severe on the right, least severe on the left, but all of these animals were defective. This was a, uh, a color dilute. It wasn't even a full albino sire, and these conditions are usually, in my experience, passed through the sire. Um, but there's a wide range, and birth defects, as I'll say it again, always hap happen in groups. So this particular animal, you can see that uh, it looks like approximately normal length, but there is a cleft lip, and there is also cleft palate, one of the other major abnormalities was it had unilateral renal aplasia. Okay, 
On the other end of the spectrum, this animal is severely affected with exencephaly. The head is open, the brain is, is uh, lost during birth. The animal also had a large umbilical omphalocele with extrusion or even tration of the intestines. These two animals are interesting in the middle because they are exhibiting a condition known as inencephaly, which is fusion of the cervical vertebra, which puts their head into a stargazing position. And what you're not seeing on this particular uh, image is that they also had severe defects of the neural tube. This is a condition known as craniorachysis, which is simply an opening of the skull and the loss of the uh, dorsal vertebral body or the vertebral arch. Um, there are only remnants of the spinal cord and brain remaining. They sort of get scraped off during birth. And you can see that that head's in an abnormal position because essentially five of the seven vertebrae are actually fused. This is the top of that animal. You can see we're looking straight down onto the, uh, the vertebral bodies and this is where the spinal cord should be. Um, this particular neural tube defects are, are fairly well known in a number of species. And once again, it all goes back to defective migration of the pigmented cells from the neural crest. And that is the root problem associated with many of our neural tube defects in albino animals. Now, not all albinos uh, or, or color dilute animals, partial albinos, have such severe defects. I've seen many litters like that over the years, and as we said before, it's always usually a color dilute or an albino sire. But something that you can see when either of the parents are albino is a condition that is well known in people called Wardenburg syndrome. And we see it in ferrets as well. Uh, albino or color diluted animals in a number of species are notorious for partial to total hearing loss due to defective migration of those cells from the neural crest into the inner ear, improper formation of hair cells which form endolymph. And associated with that is a condition in humans known as Wardenburg syndrome, which has a number of, of uh, clinical signs, including uh, hearing loss, uh, pigmentary abnormality with the irises. We don't see that usually in the ferrets. We do see that in cats, blue-eyed cats, where um, two eyes are either different colors or both uh, have hypoplastic uh, blue-colored irises. These animals always have some form of hair hypopigmentation, and in people you often will see a white lock of hair. Um, you can also see abnormalities in skin pigmentation as well. And of course, most of these animals are white, so it's very difficult to say that's an abnormal spot and this is normal. So we assume that uh, that happens in these particular animals. And the other thing is that uh, humans with Wardenburg syndrome uh, often have lateral displacement of the eyes. They have a very broad nasal root. Um, and so in this particular ferret, this animal was deaf. It was bilaterally deaf. And you can see that it also has very widely placed eyes with this very wide nose, which as you see more pictures of ferrets, you'll find is somewhat unusual. These animals with Wardenburg syndromes tend to have long, flat, wide heads, almost like badgers. So that's Wardenburg syndrome, usually associated with deafness. Uh, deaf, deaf ferrets still make wonderful pets. However, um, they can be a lot nippier or bitier than other animals because they're constantly being startled. Okay, let's finish up with a couple of other uh, diseases uh, not congenital of the nervous system. This is a great picture from Mike Garner of a meningioma um, within the third ventricle of a ferret, or at least extending into the third ventricle, separating the cerebral halves. 
we don't see a whole lot of uh, of neoplasia in the nervous system of ferrets. The number one tumor overall in the nervous system, as it is in almost every other system, is lymphoma. Lymphoma is the number third uh, tumor overall in ferrets, obviously the number one malignancy. And we do see a fair amount, even primary cases of lymphoma within ferret nervous system. I have seen just about everything, not in any great numbers. One thing I've learned over the years with ferrets is never say never. When I say I've never seen something, then shortly after we'll, afterwards I will see my first case of that. Um, so I've seen meningiomas, I've seen astrocytomas, oligos, just about anything that you will see in any type of mammal, um, you will eventually, if you look long enough, see it in ferrets. The eyes are an extension of the nervous system, so we will briefly cover common problems of the eyes. Uh, ferrets develop cataracts. They appear to be spontaneous. They may be increased in certain lines, so there's probably a genetic basis. Most of them are in older animals, so it's a culmination of a number of insults over the years. I have not seen them in animals that are hand-raised on milk replacer. Um, I have not as of yet, which means I'll probably see it soon, see them in diabetic ferrets. I would assume that they do occur, and we are seeing more and more diabetic ferrets these days due to the widespread therapeutic use of prednisone for a number of conditions in ferrets. Uh, of course, diabetic cataracts arise from high levels of glucose in the anterior chamber, which is absorbed by the lens and overwhelms the lens's ability to process glucose as its major energy source. It's converted to sorbitol, and the sorbitol sort of sits there, drawing fluid into the lens, resulting in hydropic degeneration, rupture of lens epithelium, and the formation of a cataract. Um, but we do see cataracts very commonly in older animals. This is one of my favorite pictures taken by an owner and just a really nice illustration of bilateral mature cortical cataracts. This is a ferret named Johnny Angel and Johnny had elevated, uh, very elevated uh, pressure in one of his eyes. And they don't tend to exhibit pupithalmia very much. Um, most cases of glaucoma are diagnosed when the eye becomes blind. And his pressures were up to about 120 millimeters. And they're stoic animals. They don't show pain very well. And uh, we decided to have this eye removed. And the owner was kind enough to send me this follow-up picture of how well it had healed. And he was doing great. And when I saw that, I immediately saw that the other eye, the pupil, was greatly dilated, and it turned out that uh, that that eye had to be removed as well. And one thing about ferrets, they do very well when they're blind because of the next disease we'll talk about. We see a lot of blind ferrets, and owners often never know that they're actually blind because they tend to uh, uh, they tend to not use their vision's never good to start with, and uh, in situations where there are multiple ferrets, they will pair up with another ferret as a seeing eye ferret, and you'll always see them running down the, uh, uh, down the hallway together. So Johnny Angel um, was bilaterally enucleated and went on to live for another couple of years, a very happy life. The other condition that I would mention that is very common in older ferrets is retinal disease. And I'm no ophthalmologist, so I really can't say much about uh, fundic reflections. But to see something like this with a lack of a tapetal reflection in a Fitch-colored ferret, and I don't know much about the back of the eye um, except under the microscope, but even I can tell that this is a very poor fundic reflection with no visible vessels and this is what we see in animals with, uh, uh, with retinal degeneration. Histologically, you can see the normal retina from a ferret on the, uh, on the left here with the ganglion cell layer, the rods and cones at the bottom, and, and very distinct inner and outer plexiform 
layers uh, in a a uh, affected ferret with peripheral retinopathy it starts at the periphery and comes inwards um, you can see that there are very few rods and cones left there is almost no inner plexiform layer and the outer plexiform layer is markedly reduced the Mueller fibers are more prominent here than over here and we even the ganglion cells are looking pretty weak and, and starting to check out. So this is very common. And, and uh, a lot of times people will contact me about cataracts in their ferrets. And I always uh, want to caution and make sure that before you consider removing a lens, um, you always check and make sure there's a viable retina behind it. Because cataract surgery often does not improve vision and ferrets do so well when they're blind. Oh, one more image today, and this is uh, uh, also the most common neoplasm of the eye, and this is lymphoma. Like cattle, it often pops up in the retroorbital fat rather than within the globe, and this is one where it's pressing the eye out. We see a uh, marked prolapse of the uh, nictitating gland here because that eye is being pressed outwards. Um, this particular young Jill developed this at about two years of age. The eye was removed and she never had any additional problems with lymphoma. Um, so she went on to uh, be overtaken by another disease late in life, um, but this was a very good surgical result. Very few cases of lymphoma are like that, but uh, the ferret-owning population are wonderful people and they will go to the ends of their earth and she wanted to try to uh, remove this and see what happened, and it really worked out. Okay, well, that's it for, uh, for the basic introduction and also uh, nervous system. We're going to come back in the next lecture. We'll break it into a couple because we're going to talk about the gastrointestinal tract, and there's a lot going on in the GI tract of the ferret. Hey, thanks for your time and attention. Hope you've enjoyed this little lecture. Please be sure to visit the Foundation's Facebook page and YouTube channel on a regular basis. And uh, I look forward to doing more lectures for you. Thank you so much.